Obrigado. Tá bom, beleza. Não precisa botar muito novo. All right, guys, we'll give everybody a couple more minutes to hop on. Tonight we have Professor James uh, teaching some butterfly techniques from butterfly. Uh, we also have, of course, the head of our Ghost Squad Association, yes. Professor Buyu, yes. Professor Tom is on. Um, please remember to put your chat or your questions in the chat box here. And if anybody has multiple devices, please remember to mute one of them so we don't get feedback. Is it, uh, is it too late to back out? Uh, yes. Yep. Nikki's going to laugh at you if you do. I'm used to that. James, professor. Yes. Born and raised in Michigan? Um, born in Texas, but raised in Michigan. One what, what made you, the family, move to Michigan? What's the main core? Um, so long story short, uh, when oh, we're gonna enjoy a long story, don't worry, we have plenty of time. <laughs> All right, um, so when my parents got divorced, my mom wanted to move back where her family's from, and so she came up here despite the snow. I don't, I'm still not sure why, but that's what she did. Uh, that's a story. That's a long story. Fighting is always on your DNA. Um, well, I wrestled. Um, in middle and high school. And then uh, as far as fighting stuff goes, I was actually, when I was at uh, search and rescue swimmer school, um, there was a guy who was all padded up and he told me that he was a cage fighter. And cage fighter? Was, like, yeah. like the, the, not the background fights, right? Like the regular cage fighting stuff? Uh, well, I don't know. This was in 2002. And so I thought he was full of crap. I thought Cage fighting was only done in like movies. I didn't think that's something people actually did. Like blood sports kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, like kumate, that kind of kumate. stuff. Yeah, so I thought he was just being crazy. Um, but then when I got out of the Navy, I was like, man, I miss wrestling. I need something physical. I wonder if that guy uh -huh. was actually being truthful. And so I looked up cage fighting and uh, what martial art was best for and everything online said jujitsu. So then that's when I started doing jujitsu. And when you took your first class, there was something that you expected. There was something completely different. There was something that, oh man, that's that's kind of like same as this such and such a martial arts. Um, the only thing really that I remember from my first class is, and I'm sure um, no one with a wrestling background has ever had this thought before. But I was like, oh, I'll show up and I should be all right. And yeah. then I wasn't. I got my butt kicked. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, you're not the first one, my friend. Most of wrestlers. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of the wrestling. Uh, how wrestlers always start. Um, especially, when I, they, I, especially they get when they get introduced to the butterfly game, and then they kind of like completely change their upside down view. Yes, that's and butterfly is my favorite guard. There we go. You see, you you kind of like a game changer for yourself. But uh, the way that I see when they when they realize that. Uh, how a cockroach leaves with their back on the floor and then they're gonna say oh, okay i have six legs and uh, i won't get out of this you know what i mean <laughs> like um but but that but that's a good start you know like at least you know you start you you i'm pretty sure you maybe can say you humble yourself you know when you starting to do jujitsu you know? yeah i got uh i got destroyed and i'm i'm really competitive um and that i like to compete not Oh, oh, I know that part because when you roll with me, it looks like I'm on the finals of the world <laughs> championship 2035. Yeah, but you're always winning. It, you move in slow motion, and I'm just trying to figure out how you're choking me with different things. Listen, where did you learn how to lie, man? That's such a liar. Yeah, I don't. It, that's not how it feels. Okay. And let me but, ask you a question, uh, James. Uh, yes, like, sir. Once, once you mentioned that you were a competitor, you mentioned your, your wrestling background, like wh how was your first tournament? Like when you step on the mats with the gi and then you kind of like, what did you realize on that moment? I mean, of course, like you can say before the fight, during the fight and after the fight. So everybody can uh, have a little bit of a piece of understanding, uh, you know, that since we're warming up the chat right now, it's just a little quick, question and answer uh 
maybe Professor Tom and I know Amir won't have any questions. Maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. But at least myself, personally speaking, you know, like um, we're talking to a lot of people those days, you know. Uh, just this morning, I was chatting with uh, like three other professors, you know. But on that sense, when you step on the mats, like your first match, right, with the gi, how, how, how do you feel? Like how was before, during the match and after the match? What was your thoughts? So for me personally, I'm, I'm always super duper nervous before the match. Um, so I, I try to do like a really good warm up, and um, I usually spend like 10 minutes kind of joking and goofing around with my teammates and friends. But then about 20 to 30 minutes before the match, I kind of just go into my own little quiet place um, and just kind of think about what I'm going to do. But I'm really, 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 really nervous. Um, but then once I step out onto the mat, um, usually I'm just kind of in the moment and even though I was nervous and had butterflies before, um, right when I step out on the mat, I'm kind of ready to go. And I'm not really thinking about much except for my game plan and different contingencies. Um, and then after the match, uh, that oftentimes depends on how the match goes, not win or loss, but how I felt I performed individually. Um, so if I lose a match, but I feel like I fought my best, um, then I'm okay with that. I'm good. Um, if I win a match, but I feel like I didn't compete my best, then I'm, I, I'm pretty frustrated. Um, so I try to be really analytical and reflective about uh, my performance compared to what I'm capable of, um, not necessarily uh, the direct visible outcome of the match. Um, and then I usually talk to my coaches and figure out uh, what I did right and then what I need to focus on as far as improvements, specific situations, things that maybe I didn't see that I need to revisit. Did you, James, did you do MMA first or jiu-jitsu or kind of simultaneous? Like Amir and I kind of started jiu-jitsu. We already had a striking background and we started jiu-jitsu and MMA kind of simultaneously doing jiu-jitsu for MMA at first and then progressing into jujitsu for jujitsu, if you would, which one did you start and why? So um, I wanted to do MMA, um, but uh, uh, my instructor had a rule that you couldn't do MMA until you were your, uh, until you earned your blue belt. And so I did jujitsu first. Um, and I did, I think one tournament as a white belt, maybe two um, before I got promoted to blue. And then I started fighting uh, shortly after that. But um, for the first while, probably three or four years of MMA, uh, we didn't do true MMA because it was taught by a, a jujitsu guy. So like our striking was abysmal. Um, and you know, I was a better striker than someone who had never trained before, but I wasn't better than someone who had trained boxing for a week. So it was, the striking was bad. So um, I continued the jujitsu all the way through. And then when I started training uh, at Amir's, that's when I started working on my striking, which still isn't good, um, but I made lots of improvements there. So jujitsu first, um, but except for the first six months or so, kind of jujitsu and MMA simultaneously. And then when I was done fighting, um, I just kept doing jujitsu, obviously, and I'll do it as well I'm dead. How did you, how did you find your way to Amir? How did that happen? Um, so uh, I actually took a fight against uh, one of his students last minute. And um, like they called me up the day of the match and said, hey, his opponent fell out. Um, do you want to take it? And I was like, sure. So uh, we fought and then I met Amir afterwards. He was super cool and nice. Um, and then uh, Amir and my uh, former instructor kind of made like an arrangement where I would come down to Kalamazoo and teach jujitsu and then I would stay and learn MMA and then I would teach MMA back up in Grand Rapids. And so I was like a dual exchange student kind of thing. Um, and then uh, I was lucky enough to find a job down in Kalamazoo, uh, which worked perfectly. So then that's when I kind of shifted 
permanently down in Kalamazoo. And then I've been with Mirror Mirror ever since. Been a huge part of our school, um, excellent addition to our MMA program. He was actually one of our first professional fighters uh, at Lightning Kicks. And obviously he's uh, just been the heart of the school ever since he's been with us for, oh boy, how many uh, years? 11 James? years, I think. Over Maybe. a decade at least. So super loyal, super hardworking, very friendly and loving towards all the students and a great mentor to have at our school. We're very blessed to have him. So I'm really excited to have him share some techniques with you guys tonight. Um, he is phenomenal. Like you guys understand, he has the MMA background. He's also the head wrestling coach for our local high school here. And he's been teaching jujitsu um, for over 11 years at Lightning Kicks and uh, just an awesome all around guy. So please remember, if you have any questions, put them in the chat, I'll facilitate. Um, questions initially should be towards jujitsu or jujitsu focused. And as we move on, we'll open it up to questions to the other professors and any questions about life and just chat and see how everybody's doing. So with this, James, we'll have you uh, go ahead and get started for us. Thank you so much for doing this tonight. No problem. Thanks for uh, having me. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have a jujitsu dummy or someone that you can grab and, and do the stuff with. I'll try to show it so you can kind of either watch and learn or you can try to do it without somebody. Um, but if you have a dummy or a friend, um, go ahead and grab it real quick. A lot of jujitsu is kind of having foresight. And uh, I had a lot of foresight because I made my own grappling dummy about 16 years ago. And so this is who I'm going to use for my, my demonstrations today. And uh, I'll talk um, a little bit about the concept that, <laughs> the concept that uh, um, kind of allows for the techniques that we'll do today. And one of the big things that I like to do with uh, jujitsu when I think about how I'm grappling and what I'm doing is um, reaction or actions versus reaction. So um, if I'm grappling with Amaya, I'll try to... So if I'm grappling with my daughter and uh, I pull her towards me, her gut reaction is gonna be to back up. And likewise, if I push into her, she's gonna feel that and wanna fight it naturally. And so she's gonna pull into me. And so I want to use that action reaction principle to my advantage, setting up all the things that uh, I'm going to do. And so if we're looking at butterfly guard and with butterfly guard, in case you're not quite sure, that's where I have my feet in between her legs and my knees are outside of it. Right. So I've got my shins kind of blocking her from moving closer. So the first thing that we're going to do, um, partly as a warm up and partly to practice uh, the first movements we're going to do is once I'm in position, one hand is going to come down and grab at the end of the sleeve. The other hand grabs a cross collar grip, right? So if, if it's my right hand, I'm going to reach across my body and grab the opposite side lapel so my fingers are in thumb out. So in case you can't see, I'll be like this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull her upper body towards me. And then as she reacts, I'm going to lift up and out with my feet. So I pull her towards me as she reacts up and out with my feet. So I'm just going to do that uh, maybe 10 times and then switch. So upper body pulls in, lifting out to get distance back with your feet. And then if you're doing this, I'll watch and try to yell at you if I see you doing something a little goofy. Professor James, while they're drilling that, can you explain to us the importance of constant um, push-pull motion with the lower body and upper body and what happens if that lacks? So if we're not pushing hard enough with the feet or pulling hard enough with upper body, while they're drilling, if you can go ahead and explain that to us, that'd be great. Yep, so um, for any of you guys who were here on Tuesday, uh, Jeremy Horn kind of touched on it as well. But anytime I'm not making my opponent adjust and move, um, I, I run the risk of giving him a chance to attack and get settled. 
And so by constantly making him adjust his position and react to, to what I'm doing, I'm uh, stopping him from being, uh, being able to go on the offensive and get comfortable. And I'm making him constantly defend uh, the things that I'm doing. And as long as he stays on the defensive, that means I can work towards what I'm looking for. And uh, if you have to react, you're always going to be half a second behind. If I stop moving, then uh, my opponent can start uh, getting his grips, moving me, uh, and then I have to respond and all of a sudden I'm on the back leg. Awesome. Thank you. I have one more question just from watching the guys here. Is butterfly more effective when the person doing it is sitting up or laying down flat on their back? Oh, uh, great question. So um, I can't think of a single guard that's best when you're flat on your back. You almost always want to have some kind of an angle, at least in my experience. So um, even, uh, so we'll, we'll do this with butterfly guard first. So with butterfly guard, um, I rarely am going to be down like this. Um, I'm going to try to be up a little bit, right? And I want to be close to my uh, my partner, um, but I want my back off the ground for the most part. But um, even if I'm in like a regular guard, if I'm in regular guard, but I'm flat on my back, like I am right now, then I'm going to have a hard time moving. What I'm going to try to do is adjust onto one side, and that's going to allow me to be much more mobile um, versus being flat on my back, where my partner is going to have the leverage um, advantage. Perfect. Thank you very much. It looks like most of the people drilling got it down. Awesome. So um, we'll look at a couple uh, things. But first off, um, I'm going to show you guys one of my all time favorite attacks. And that's a loop choke in this position. So I absolutely love loop chokes. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, just as we practice, but all we're going to do now is add one more step to it. So first, I'm going to pull with the sleeve and the collar, the collar is the most important part. I'm going to pull both towards me. And then as she reacts, I'm going to lift up and kick my feet out, just how we practiced earlier. Once that happens, I'm starting to take her back. So um, her reaction is going to be to start coming towards me again. And as soon as that happens, I pull with my collar um, across the body. So I don't want to pull her straight towards me. I want to take her head and put it into the armpit that has the grip. So I pull down and across. Do it from a different angle. Um, actually, go this way. So after I kick her out, as she's coming towards me, I'm going to pull down and across and put my armpit on top of her head. That's really, really important. If my armpit's just on uh, like her forehead, it's easy for her to lift, look up and I lose the choke. I want to put my armpit as close to her neck as I can. I want to eliminate as much space as I can get. So what I'm doing is that action reaction, but twice. As I pull, she reacts by backing up. I, I kind of help her go that direction. So she's moving further than she intended. She panics and moves towards me. And that's when I'm able to pull her down into the loop choke. All right, so it's not a one step, but a two step uh, submission. Awesome, that's beautiful. And this is called a loop choke, you said. What are, yeah. you doing with, what are you doing with your left hand? I had a little hard time seeing what you were doing with your left hand feeding the head. If you could show that again one more time, please. Yep. So um, there's kind of two variations to finish this based on how far forward she's going. And depending on what she does will determine uh, what my left hand is doing. So if everything goes beautifully, as she comes forward, all this hand is going to do is going to like pull her head down to help it clear my armpit. Sometimes if that doesn't happen, her forehead will just run into my shoulder and then I can't choke her from there. So if, if everything's going well, my hand comes down, I pop forward and now her head's stuck. So this just helps to kind of guide it where it's supposed to go. Um, sometimes though, if they're a better grappler, especially as I'm pulling everything down, uh, there's gonna be some resistance. I won't be able to get her head all the way where I want it to. When that happens, instead of my hand going to the back of her head, 
I'm gonna put my forearm on the back of her head. All right, so I just basically have my arm in deeper and my hand goes underneath my elbow on the far side. So as I pull, my forearm is on the back of her neck and then my hand goes underneath my elbow. And what this does is my forearm now acts like my armpit does. Hmm. Instead of getting it all the way here, where now her head's stuck, if she's not coming far enough, I can use my forearm to act as that uh, third leg of the triangle. And uh, I'm gonna pull down and lift up and that's enough pressure to finish the choke. Beautiful, that's beautiful, thank you. What keeps the person that you're doing this to from turning to her right to escape the choke? How are you holding her in place there? So uh, I'm using my legs, so my, my feet are still between her thighs. And so as long as I'm able to do that, she has to get her, her knee to the opposite side of the body. So if both of her knees are on opposite sides of my body, she can't twist very far. And she can turn a little bit, but she gets stuck here. Um, if I lose one of my legs, then I want to drop down into a half guard and just keep pulling and I'm able to, to secure the choke. So um, the choke is happening on the upper body. I'm using my feet and legs to secure her lower body. Awesome, thank you very much. How's everybody so, doing? Any, any questions yep. on that? We do have one more question here. So uh, you're not going to your back for this first part. Can you show the finish with the other hand and his foot? So if you could just reverse it for us, if I'm understanding that correctly. And that's from Professor Tom. Yep. So I will happily show this again because Maya's been a little sassy today. And so she deserves uh, this a couple of times. So everything switched. I've got this here. So for the finish, first I pull, she reacts. So I kick up and back. Then as she pulls in again, my hand comes up. I push on the head and I drive everything into this armpit. And one thing that I didn't mention earlier that can be an important detail, as I'm pulling this down and towards me, I'm gonna pop my shoulder up a little bit. So I don't just go straight forward, but I kind of pop it up. Then I pinch everything down. And this is what allows me to get my choke. Beautiful. It looks like most of the people are drilling it right now. And they got it down, especially the Reeser family. I feel sorry for Ryan. So Professor James, Professor Thomas asking again, you, you prefer to stay in butterfly guard? Uh, for this particular finish, I usually try to stay in butterfly guard. Um, once I get here, my opponent's going to have one of two reactions. Um, the first reaction that I usually get is they're going to try to pull their head out, and they can't do that if they're moving their legs very well. So typically, both hands come up and start working my upper body. And so I don't need a super tight, secure grip. Um, just having my feet between theirs and applying pressure on the inside of the thighs is enough to stop them from moving. Um, the only other thing that I've seen people do once they realize my feet aren't moving from butterfly is they'll try to like kick their legs out almost like a sprawl. And it's really hard for me to block the feet that way. When that happens, so when everything pops out for a sprawl, um, what I'll do is I'll take my free hand and I'll reach down and grab the leg and then I'll pivot underneath and I'll finish it uh, that, that same way. I often will get this off of a shot as well. Um, and actually in my last, uh, my last pro jiu-jitsu match, I finished a choke or second to last. I finished a choke um, almost this exact same position uh, because the person sprawled. You grab the leg and then they don't have any way to, to spin out of it. Awesome, thank you. So a couple of questions about details here. Uh, 
Professor Tom is wondering if you have a, a marker or a placement for the first grip, where, how high, how deep is it relative to the collarbone? Do you, do you like to grab for that first one? Yep. Yeah, so um, I, it can't be very loose because if it's too loose, I won't be able to finish the choke. But at the same time, if it's really, really deep, um, the choke won't be tight. And also whenever you get a deep grip on the collar, it makes them really anxious and, and worried about a choke coming in. So what I like to do is um, I think like if I'm holding a glass, I want my knuckles to be uh, lined up just underneath the ear. So if we get a little bit closer here, if I'm like this, way too deep, right? I won't be able to get the choke. If I'm down kind of by her, her jaw, this is way too shallow. That's gonna be difficult for me to finish. I want my knuckles to be pretty much straight underneath her ear, just like this. So if I give a thumbs up, it should be right in front of her ear. And that general position is where I like to keep my lapel grip um, for almost everything, but whenever I'm setting up this choke, which is one of my go-tos, especially this kind of general spot, it's high enough to give me a good angle, but not so high that they start panicking and getting too defensive. Perfect, beautiful. Uh, Professor Buyu makes a remark. He's wondering, do you, if the person stays on their knees while you're executing this choke, do you use your legs or your butterfly to stretch them out? Um, so it depends on kind of how it's feeling. Um, I prefer uh, typically to keep my legs close and adjust my elbow to finish the choke. Um, I'll only stretch out my legs if they're backing theirs up some or if they're pressuring really hard into me. So some people would pressure like this to try to like get my back flat on the mat um, and lift their butt up. If that happens, then I'll extend it in order to keep the choke. Um, but I don't immediately try to do that. I oftentimes will finish it just from the sitting up butterfly position. Perfect, thank you. All right, real quick, before we go on to the next one, uh, we, there's a few people on here I need to thank real quick. Uh, Coach, um, we have Nikki and we have Randy. He's out at the station. We have firefighter, nurse, and doctor. Thank you guys so much for your service dur during this time. We really appreciate you. Thank you for taking care of our community. Sorry to interrupt, Professor James. Go ahead with your next technique, please. All right, so um, the first one was a submission. Now we're gonna look at um, just a basic sweep from that uh, same position, that same butterfly. So uh, for this one, and let me know if you need me to adjust the camera differently. But for this one, everything starts uh, the same. I've got my hand the exact same spot on the lapel and my other hand has the same side sleeve. You can do this if you just have the elbow, um, but I almost always grab the sleeve. Uh, it's usually just as easy to get and the grip is much, much better. Once this happens, I'm gonna take the hand and I'm just gonna drive it straight between our legs. So I'm basically trying to like punch down, like you see the old karate guys punching bricks, <laughs> that same, same motion, straight down between our legs. Then I pull her into me, just like I was doing earlier. But this time, instead of staying up, I'm going to roll to my shoulder um, that's pushing her arm down. So both my hands are on the same side of my body and it's that side that I'm gonna roll to. So I lean down towards my shoulder and now one of my legs is coming up. The leg that's coming up should be right underneath her knee and I'm going to continue to roll as I kick that leg, almost like it's an elevator. That's why it's called an elevator sweep. So I kick, and then I come all the way up. Let me see if I can do that a little further away so you guys can see. Uh, so I've got the grip, hand goes down. I put my head, I want to bury it tight to her shoulder. I roll down, big kick, and then I'm up. I keep the hand and the lapel the entire way. Beautiful. One more time from a different angle. Awesome, awesome. 
And because you're the ninja bunny, you're obviously landing in neon belly. But do you have a preference if the person lands in sight control, full mount, neon belly? What's your what's your thought on that? Um, <clears throat> I mean, you you want to land, you want to land in as advantageous a position as you can. Um, but I say that with the caveat that sometimes people try to to overreach what their positioning will allow them to safely get, and they end up missing everything. So when I think of uh, jujitsu, um, I'm not worried about self-defense. If someone wants my wallet, they're going to get my wallet. Um, I think about like, if I'm in a competition or if we're, we're competing. So uh, if you try to force mount and they grab your leg and put you in a guard, you miss um, potentially quite a few points. So me personally, I almost always try to end up in uh, either side control or neon belly. And then once I've established my points, then I'll try to get to mount. I rarely try to get straight to mount. Awesome. Is that, Thank you. Is that what and you were asking about? Does. Yes, it clarifies it. Now, before you roll, can you explain to us where you're placing that hook on the right, on the far side? Is it better to have it closer to the knee or to their hip, the groin area? or somewhere in between? Um, so that's a great question. 95% um, of the time as I'm trying to roll, uh, as I'm going down towards my shoulder, um, I'm going to actually, I can kind of show you from the, uh, from the back side here. All right, so as I'm starting to roll, my foot goes way at the knee. So I'm not way up high here. I'm down at the knee. And that gives me much more leverage to actually kick and extend her the direction that I want her to. Um, the only time that I'll kick instead of towards the knee, more towards like the crotch, is if I really don't like the person, I'm not worried about sweeping them. I just want them to have a bad day. Awesome, awesome. Uh, we have a couple of questions real quick. Um, from Matthew. He's wondering how long it took you to get your black belt. Uh, that's a good, good question. So um, I started training in 2005 um, and I got my black belt uh, almost three years ago. So um, what, 13 years, I think? 12 years, 12, 13 years. Um, now, during that time, um, when I was most serious into MMA, I took about two years where I trained jujitsu. I didn't, I didn't teach or train very much. I was teaching classes um, for a good chunk of that time, but not training much in jujitsu. I was focusing more on MMA. And then um, I also took uh, like a year break. Um, so training time, probably nine-ish years, nine or 10 years, um, where I was actively training consistently. Um, total time, 13, I think, 12 or 13 years. Nice. He also is wondering about the nickname Ninja Bunny and the history of that. <laughs> so um, when I was in the Navy, um, me and three other friends had a paintball team and we weren't very good. We were just a pro-am paintball team, but um, everybody had like super serious, like uh, SEAL team paint or massacre lightning bolt, we're Viking gonna kill you paintball teams. And we thought that was like obnoxious because it was just paintball. Um, so we tried to think of the dumbest name we could and uh, the Ninja Bunnies of Doom is what we came up with. And then uh, we all got out around the same time. And before we did, we all got Ninja Bunny tattoos of our logo. And then when I started training, People kept asking me what the Pokemon on my arm was. Uh, and I was like, it's not a Pokemon, it's a Ninja Bunny. And then they started calling me Ninja Bunny. And so um, that's kind of how it stuck. Awesome. Matthew's very happy with that answer. Yeah, I'm a very, right. I'm a very straight laced serious person, um, if you haven't been able to tell. And so the, uh, the Ninja Bunny thing kind of fits with that pretty well. Awesome. Uh, one more question. Um, when you're doing your butterfly sweep, the second one, are both of your feet inside between her knees? 
Yeah, great question. So um, typically, yes, but they don't have to be. Um, so if we focus on kind of the, the feet part of it again. So as I start from, as I start in butterfly, both my feet are in. So this is typically where my positioning will be. And um, it doesn't have to be though. Um, I can, as an example, as I'm rolling, I can take my down foot against the knee and kick, almost like a, a scissor sweep variation where I kick that leg out so they can't post. Um, or uh, you can get something similar if you're in like a weird half guard variation uh, because you're blocking that leg and then you can still lift that up. So I like to think of this more as a movement than a specific technique. Um, one of the things that kind of gets people in trouble is they'll see a technique from one specific spot and then um, they'll miss that technique from a lot of similar areas. And so it doesn't, you don't have to be perfectly in a butterfly guard to get this. As long as you have one foot uh, near their knee and you're controlling the lapel and ideally the opposite arm, then you can get this from many kind of similar spots. So it's not like, oh, you have to be here, 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 here. And if everything's perfect, you can get it. It's more of a, anytime you're in this general area, um, you've got this technique or a close variation, at least as a tool for you. Beautiful, awesome guys. If you have any questions, please uh, type it in the chat box here. We're gonna open it up for questions. And we'll also open it up for Professor Tom, Professor Buyu, if you guys are ready to chime in, go ahead. Tom first. Uh, no, that was, that was awesome. And I think it flows well with what um, we, we learned on Tuesday from Jeremy. So I, I love that game. Oh, awesome. I, I thought, you know, that for sure you show some top game pressure smush thing because that's what you do most of the time. Yeah, so I, uh, I definitely am a top grappler. Um, I, I've tried really to focus the last couple of years of being more well-rounded um, because I don't want to just be a top guy. I want to, you know, be good on my back and um, bottom side control and all those other spots. Um, but definitely like side control, knee and belly are my two most dominant positions. Um, but one of the things in forcing myself to improve in my weakest areas is uh, taking every advantage I can to work on those. And so by teaching something that I wouldn't just kind of default to, it's helped uh, help me kind of focus on those areas as well. Um, do you think that, because I, I agree, I'm, I'm, I prefer top all the time. And, and I always, I guess, blame it on the fact that I came from like an MMA background, like you and Amir. And so I'm wondering, is that something, two questions, kind of twofold. Is that why you prefer top or is that just a wrestling mindset? You get there and you like it or uh, is that it? Um, that's the first kind of thing. And number two is now you're saying you're going kind of wide. Um, I remember as a blue belt deciding like, okay, I, I don't want to be a guard guy or I don't want to be a disc I want to be a well-rounded guy. And, and now, especially as at black belt, I feel like it's super important to kind of have a, a range, even of moves that I don't necessarily use so that I can teach it to people. Maybe they're small, maybe they're big, maybe they're not flexible, maybe they have all the attributes that I don't have, but I still want to be able to teach it to them. Uh, do you find yourself, do you like that when you're any, any maybe a, uh, blue belt coming up, do you recommend they go deep and choose butterfly guard or one guard and one game and go really deep and be good at that or kind of go broad? Which, what's your thought on that? Um, so uh, the first question, um, I, I think the mindset as far as being like a top guy kind of goes twofold. One, um, I think that whatever you start with is going to be your foundation and everything else gets built upon that. And so since I had done so much wrestling before I started grappling, um, I built my jujitsu off of a wrestling foundation. And uh, you almost never want to be 
on bottom in wrestling, you always want to be on top. And so that was um, like my starting point. And so everything's been built from that. And uh, I think that's a big part of it. Um, the second part is when I'm on top, I have to worry about 200 pounds. When I'm on bottom, I have to worry about 400. And uh, I'm not the smartest math guy in the world, but I would much rather only have to worry about 200 pounds. Um, so I don't like, I like being on bottom for that or top for that. But I do think it's fun being on bottom um, because on top, I feel like it's more of a, I'm, I have to force them to move where I want them to for the most part. Whereas when I'm on bottom, uh, because I have direct control of their weight, if I'm doing things properly, um, it's more like a game where I get to punish them for not being perfectly in control of their weight. So I enjoy both, but um, I think that's why I like being on top personally. And then as far as depth versus width, um, I, so for me personally, um, two reasons why I am trying to focus on my, my breadth is um, I started teaching um, really early on in my jujitsu career. I don't, that feels like a weird thing to call it. Am I like jujitsu time? And so, um, whereas most people spend the first six to 10 years in a pure student mode um, or really close to it, I was in like a pure student mode for like a year, year and a half. And then after that, I started at least teaching half of my time. And so um, I had like a narrow thing, but because I taught it so often, I got really good at it. Um, and so now I'm trying to make up for that by, by kind of spreading out and all those things that I missed being like, oh, cool. Now I get to learn the funky reverse half donkey guard. I've never seen this before. Um, you know, whereas I'm like, oh, you want the guard? I can show you two perfect things from the guard. And you know, and now I'm trying to just branch that out a bit. Um, and then also, uh, and, and I know that almost, almost everybody kind of has the same experience, but when you're first starting off and you meet a black belt for the first time or train with a black belt for the first time, it's kind of like meeting Jesus for the first time. It's like, this person can do no wrong. They aren't even trying and they know how to do everything from everywhere. And then, you know, you, you get your black belt and it's like, oh, those guys knew everything. I don't know anything. And, um, you know, it's just a matter of like perspective and kind of realization. Um, but my goal is to, I, I want to live up to what the belt demands of me and expects of me. And um, it's not like, oh, I got my black belt. So now I know everything. It's, oh, I got my black belt. I realize how much there is to know. And it's so fascinating and exciting and curious. And I'll, I'll learn like the dumbest thing, like, oh, from, from guard, if you want to get the cross collar choke better, just shift your thumb half an inch this way. And I'll like giggle about it for two days about how something so simple has just eluded me for so long. And it'll make something from good to great. And that kind of discovery and that learning is... Uh, like the greatest thing to me. I, I think that's just part of me being a science guy is I love discovering cool new things. And so I get so excited. And if you only specialize in a narrow field, um, you miss out on all the other stuff. And so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, would, I would recommend if you want to be a competitive blue belt, to try to specialize in maybe a couple things, but you, you can't neglect other stuff just for your, your specialization. Um, but at the same time, if you're trying to learn everything all at once, you're going to get overwhelmed. And so um, like one of the things I recommend to our white belts is learn one submission and one sweeper pass from everywhere. And if, if you know, like one thing from guard, one thing from half guard, blah, 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 then you'll be a well-rounded white belt. And then when you become a blue belt, try to have three things from everywhere. And uh, if there's something you're super passionate, get to five. And then as you become a purple belt, instead of having five, make it 10 or 12 and uh, add a second or a third position where you really want to kind of deep dive at it. Um, 
Now, with that being said, I don't know how good of advice that is, but that's, that's what I, I tell them. But if people try to like come to class in the first year, every day, something new, it feels like if they try to learn and get good at all of it, um, realistically, it's not going to happen. Um, whereas if they are like, Hey, from this position, I really like this sweep and this submission, they jot it down and that's what they focus on during live goes and drills. Then, uh, after a year, they should have a pretty good feel for those couple of things and at least have been exposed to the others. So their second time through it or uh, when they see it later, like, oh, now that makes sense. Cool. I'm going to start doing this again. Um, that, that's just kind of how I approach it. Well, Cooch, Cooch says that if he didn't learn anything else and he just remembered everything he's already been taught, he would be fantastic. <laughs> well, uh, number one, I think Cooch is already fantastic. Uh, but number <laughs> Number two, I know that feeling. I feel like I've forgotten more techniques than I've uh, I know currently. Um, but that's kind of kind of cool because then when you see it again, you're like, oh yeah, that's awesome. I forgot all about that, and then uh, you just kind of fall in love all over again. Uh, I'd like to ask that kind of question to Buyu and and Amir. Um, did you find when you were coming up, did you go broad or did you go deep? Did you have like special moves? Uh, that you preferred and went to all the time. Of course, we all have that, like my go-to when you're a blue purple belt. But would you recommend that? Like, go wide, go deep, go kind of – I know a lot of people kind of go one or the other. You guys have a preference? Will you and Amir? Amir first. Uh, yes, sir. Um, well, for me, it was a little bit different because um, I actually prefer bottom just because that was my, my comfortable zone my go-to and that was kind of forced upon me um, because if I was training for fighting and I ended up in a room full of all Americans, Matt Hughes, Robbie Lawler, Veach, uh, I wasn't going to get on top of those guys and I, I was forced to get better on the bottom and it just became habit. Plus if I was going to be on top, I'd much rather be standing up and punching you and kicking you. So uh, that's the initial reason my game developed the way it did. Uh, but then it just became, you know, like you said, my comfort zone, my habit. And if anybody rolls with me, I'm, I wouldn't say passive, but it's very. Um, sloth. Very sloth. Sloth is sloth, the word. Yeah. Sloth yeah. is what they they call me when I when I roll. Um, but yeah, I mean, the first time when I transferred from Matt Hughes's place to go to train with Jeremy, it was almost awkward because we're both used to getting ground up by those guys, by, you know, all the All-American team. And we just kind of sit in front of each other like, come at me, bro. No, you come at me, bro. And it was just this awkward, you know, like no engagement, but yeah, that's, that's how my style developed. Boy, uh, since I'm this smaller guy, uh, to be on top for me, it was like a biggest challenge. Um, so basically jujitsu came for me for like, you know what, that's your surviving mode skills, jujitsu for self-defense. Because, uh, like I said, you know, I was a smaller guy. I won't be able to get on top of anybody. So I said, you know what? It is what it is. Let, let adapt my game to the environment. So I always, still this day, I like to, you know, be on my back, play on the bottom. I don't mind. Uh, and then uh, depending who I roll with, I like to feel their energy, you know. If uh, the frequency of their energy, it's a little bit high, Mine's going to be higher one inch. If their frequency of their energy is on the steady level, I'm going to keep on a steady. So, and then we're going to be able to extract the most from each other. Yeah. During the match, I can have ups and downs. Like I can be very passive. I can be very aggressive. But I always try to make sure uh, whoever showed up on Tuesday uh, with Jeremy Horn and Sarah, I always concern about my partner. I always concern about don't hurting him. I always concern about to extract the best out of him in all range of emotions. Um, I have similarity of what the Professor James said, you know, with the butterfly game. That's something that I like the most too. Uh, but most likely the cases I always on the bottom, you know, and I try to not force myself too much to hold on to position, you know, if the guy or the girl they have to pass. I let them pass, and I try to recover myself. Most likely, I see myself putting in a bad position, so I can work my escapes and then 
get the best out of it. That's my, just like the way that I train with the white belt, uh, with anybody, you know, we have some folks uh, at the chat that have been participating. I roll with them, you know, like, and I'm true as it is, you know, if I, if I have to let you start on my side control, I don't have no problem with that, you know. I think, Buyo, I think uh, that's pretty common in, in higher level, you know, uh, especially brown, black belt, state, and let, you know, they play deep water, right? Like you let people get you in position so that you can practice getting out. And especially if you really don't have an ego, they tap you, they get you, great. Um, I think that's a higher level thing. Would you recommend that for blue belts or white belts even? Or, I mean, obviously white belt, your survival mode a lot of times, but com coming up, at, at what stage do you feel like, okay, I've done this move enough, I'm gonna let him pass my guard or I'm gonna, you know, take a bad position. The, the, it's funny because uh, jujitsu, the way that I see it, Tom, like uh, we have that thin line of the ego that, oh, it's somebody watching me, it's my teammates watching me, it's my girlfriend, boyfriend, wife, spouse watching me, my husband watching me. So uh, I think like, um, it's more like you understanding that it's okay if somebody passes your guard. It's okay that, you know, I'm going to tap here and there. I still tap these days. I don't, I don't have no problem with that. But I think, like, uh, the way that I see, like, okay, you, you are white belt, right? You are blue belt. Okay, I just got my blue belt. Let's put it this way, right? I've been training jiu-jitsu for the past six, eight, 12 months, a year and a half, on and off, whatever. And then I got my blue belt. No way in hell, no way in place in this planet Earth that I'm going to let nobody pass my guard. Uh, I think that's kind of like uh, going backwards because you, you, the, the worst case scenario, you're going to end up getting hurt because you have that strength and the ideally that, oh, that's it. Oh, nobody's going to pass my guard. Uh, yeah, maybe for a young generation, you know, like the kid that's 16, 18, 20 years old, if he doesn't still have that, habitat of understanding that over there on their room on that class everybody's gonna learn from each other yes he's gonna act that way no matter what until he find out somebody that's really good he's gonna pass his guard as a flash and then he's gonna realize oh i should have this guy on my side control because now guess what he's on my side control and i don't know how to escape from side control you know um every time i have an opportunity uh, i try to explain this to everybody you know uh yeah you can you can battle with somebody on your way, but once you get somebody that's like two, three divisions above, things are starting to get a little bit like, you know, should I give a little bit more? Should I let this guy, you know, yeah, you should. Why not? What do you, you're only gonna gain with him. As a matter of fact, uh, many conversations that I have with Professor Tom, he always tell me that, and that's something that I learn. I learn and I keep learning, you know? Have the guy throw all his weapons. Have he think he's the beat, at that on the planet on you oh man i passed his guard such and such and such but then at the end of the day you said hey man i'm just thinking the notes the stuff that you like to do the most and i'm gonna use against you you know so you feel that little gaps that uh he likes to use with you because he's not actually he's just like try to smash you all the time he's not rolling with you like to get a good you know rolling session as a matter of fact, I just was looking over my, um, my footages that I have. I have a really good one. I'm going to see if I can, uh, uh, how can I post that? Uh, it's between Professor Tom and Professor John Piano rolling. And it's the pureness of jiu-jitsu. They're having so much fun. And this is, I think, is a statement. And I just recorded without they even notice. I put my phone on Tom's uh, dojo. And they're rolling, but they're having fun. And that's the pureness of this sport this sports particularly like there's no ego it's like two brothers uh fighting for the last plate of the pudding of the flan that mommy did it you know so let's see who's gonna get the most and that's how about it you know having fun uh Buyu, so i remember at uh it, it's funny two things that james mentioned uh i remember at brown belts I, I came to you and, you know, when I was a white belt, I, I don't remember much of that. I was doing MMA, but then blue belt, I remember trying to be an, a move encyclopedia and then purple belt, I'm choosing my moves and I kind of, you know, had my game. Uh, but at brown belt, I remember going back to like white belt moves and asking you, I'm like, okay, something like a cross collar choke, like what James was saying, like, 
this little detail, show me exactly this thing. Because, you know, at Purple Belt, I would play a lot of catch and release. I would let people go, right? I would get them in a submission, but I wouldn't tap them out. And I would let them go so I could, like, see where that would, would bring myself, you know, where the game would go from there. So I learned a lot from that. But then I couldn't finish anybody when it came to Brown Belt. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to finish people. And I couldn't finish them. And so I remember asking, like, little details to you, like, how do I finish this move? So, so that's, that's the, the first part. But then the second part was I remember also then thinking because I would let people get positioned, I would look over and I'm like, oh, man, Buyu is seeing this. This person's passing my guard and smashing me. Even though I'm letting them do all these things because I'm trying to work deeper water and stuff like that. But in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, crap. I wonder what Buyu is thinking. He's thinking I'm getting smoked here by everybody because this is what he sees. Now that I have my own place, I obviously know that you – knew what was happening. You see beyond that. You knew what I was doing, stuff like that. But back then I'm like, oh crap, Booyah was watching me get smushed. <laughs> well, like, I, of course, like, uh, when we between teammates, like, uh, that, that's the most part of the focus is like, at the end of the day, myself, particularly speaking, what I can do better for the next day, if that match, if that role was like a really hard role and the person wants to smoke you, you know? And then I'll get that, I'll stud that. And then I, you know, when I have a chance, I approach it to you or I do this every day with anybody. I approach them to people after class and say, look, working on this, this and that, you know? And after the person rolled like five, six, seven times, that, that person might be not, not even know that I was looking there rolling. You know, but then maybe the next day, the next week, I, I, I specific touch on that subject. But uh, of course, when you have when you have a visitor, I think that's the perfect way. So you can actually, OK, now I'm, I'm actually watching uh, my students roll the that guy, blue belt, purple belt, brown belt. And let me see what kind of level they are. What, let me see what they're missing, you know. And uh, I mean, I was being taught that. When, when a visitor comes to your place, you need to show the business card. You know, my professors used to tell me that and say, oh, boy. And I was, I was that type of person on the frontliner because I was one of the first ones at the gym. So they expected me that to show them. We're talking about 19s, you know. So they expected this to me, show that guy that this is, this is real, you know. Well, he's learning here. He's going to learn the real jiu-jitsu. So back in the days, it was like that. So I don't tell this to my students, but they kind of like they feel about it, the way that I, how I feel when somebody comes, you know. They're not going to try heal the person, especially if it was a white belt, you know. But if that blue belt comes, like I usually, you know, or purple belt, whatever belt he is, I usually put him with a lower belt level so I can see what his intentions are, you know, and, uh, if he really wants to come to make a name in my gym or something like that, then it's going to work all the way around, you know. But back then when I was watching you rolling, you know, I was trying to, okay, what, how I can make Tom better in that position, even if you play around or if you train seriously or you fool around or you train like for your well-being, whatever it is. So I always try to, in the back of my mind, okay, I'm watching everybody. I'm watching that person, A, B, C, X, Y, Z person, but I always make try – improvement you know and that's why i think to be honest with you this whole uh zoom thing for me it's new you know i never experienced something like that but that's being amazing you know i just learning from every single one and see everybody's faces here and you and i can tell you guys are interested you know every every tuesdays and thursdays at 7 30 we all get together you know we all drop some questions you know and uh white belts questions blue belt questions purple brown black belt questions I think that's a, a great way of seeing things, you know, well, how I can get better, you know, and, and asking the people that are with you 24-7 pretty much, you know, that's, I think that's amazing. So that's why, you know, okay, when I, this whole thing pass, I'm going to come back to the dojo, I'm going to train my best, I'm going to take my notes, I'm going to see what I can improve, you know, and just how it is, you know, in every single time that we step on the mats, you know. That's awesome, Professor. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for coming tonight. It's uh, great to see everybody. Um, we're going to be here 7.30, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Please invite your other classmates. Uh, Professor James, Tom? James had a, wanted to piggyback off what something Wu said. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, James. Well, yeah, just, just real quick, but in um, talking about, like, 
oh, no one's going to pass my guard or, um, you know, how early should you start with that kind of stuff. Um, just one thing uh, that people, it's easy to forget sometimes, especially in the heat of the moment. But um, if, if no one ever passes your guard or stops a sweep or submit to you or anything like that, then you're, you're number one, not going to learn anything. Um, and number two, that means that you're not, uh, you're not putting yourself in a position to learn. So as an example, like at our school, we have a lot of white belts, um, a fair number of blue belts, and then just a handful of purple belts. And if we're rolling and I approach that roll and I'm like, I'm going to stick to my best stuff, then um, I'm going to... I'm going to win a vast majority of those, but I'm not going to get any better. Um, if someone passes my guard because I tried to get a sweep and then I just didn't have my foot in the right place or I didn't, didn't feel their weight correctly. Well, that's good because now I know um, I need to improve on that a little bit. Um, I think it's important uh, just to kind of keep that, that, in mind when you're rolling. Um, if someone passes your guard, submits you, whatever, um, they're doing what they're supposed to and helping you discover kind of where, where you made a mistake so that you can not make it in the future. If you just stick to your best stuff and kind of blow through everybody, um, you're not, that doesn't make you any better of a grappler and uh, you're just gonna stagnate at that point. But yeah, it's, it's easy to think of those roles as like competitions, um, but they're not. That's, that's when I, you're supposed to I, learn and make those mistakes. Yeah, I love that. Uh, can I jump in real quick and uh, ask a similar question to Ryan Reeser? I know you're far away from the, from the camera there, but so Ryan, if you guys don't know, a lot of you guys probably know, but he was on the, uh, he's wearing his purple belt now because he's humble, but he was on the 08 Olympic team for judo. Um, and uh, so he's here. Ryan, do, do you find that you have the same kind of stuff, like say with even just judo moves or takedowns, like people like go home and tell their wife and their dog, hey, I threw Ryan Reeser today. Or I mean, I know it doesn't happen very often. Or do you like, like we were just talking about, do you not care? Do you let that just like, hey, man, that's awesome. I'm glad that happened or whatever. Oh, for sure. Yeah, there's no ego. I mean, in, in reality, the journey of your martial arts, nobody's going to remember that. I mean, if you're looking at that point that, oh yeah, one day I got thrown by 12 people, right? I think they look at you more of um, what you bring to the mat, what you bring to your, your teammates. Um, yeah, so I, I, I try not to even worry about that. It's, it's more of my own journey, what I'm trying to learn on, you know, what I'm trying to learn, what I'm trying to teach and uh, just helping everybody kind of get better. It doesn't matter if, we, if you get thrown. Ryan, can you get your dog real quick? Because I saw him and he was looking just adorable as can be. <laughs> I think that was a grown-up answer he gave, so that was that was really nice. But yeah, I think I, you know, I think that's something that we all, you know, need to continually remind ourselves, right? Because they say jujitsu, no ego, leave your ego at the door, blah blah blah. But sometimes it sneaks in, and we're like, mother, right? With a nail that day, right? And we leave like, ah, like I coulda, woulda, shoulda, right? But those like here my my one of my favorite quotes is a, a bad day for the ego is a good day for the soul right so if you're getting smushed it's good for you it's good for you so that's a that's a good thing there's that beautiful dog <laughs> oh <laughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Amir, I think that's it for everybody's questions and stuff. Uh, yes. James, man, thank you so much, man. That was awesome. I, I love it. I appreciate it. Everybody that came, I'm, I'm super happy you came took your time to, to do this. I love seeing all your smiling, happy faces. It's, it's a fantastic time for me. Yeah, thanks. Um, if you guys have questions on anything um, and got to go now, just shoot me a message and I'll do what I can to help uh, get back or whatever. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, everybody.